Well, hello everyone. It is a pleasure to be back on, back with you and discussing some uh, com compliments regarding electron electron interactions. So we decided with uh, Emmanuel Fromager and I to to share the uh, the presentation. So there will be I will I will I will be on the stage for the first hour, and then uh, Emmanuel will continue, and hopefully uh, to complement uh, each other's views on on well electron electron interactions. Okay, so let me start with a brief summary of what I will talk about. So I will be get back. I will get back somehow on on how to fuck, but very briefly in order to show you that well, this is not the the end of the story. So more has to be done, and we will somehow continue in two complementary uh, directions. The first one will be configuration interactions. So that be point number two, and then perturbation theory. And very honestly, that's going to be, uh, let's say, some sort of a, of a, of a guide all throughout the, the presentation. So this perturbation theory, we'll much discuss on that. In order to move on to MP2, which is very famous in the context of quantum chemistry calculations, in order to go beyond Hartree-Fock calculations, and 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 at the very end, I will, I will move on to factorization pair theories and and give a few conclusions and references. Okay, so let me make a connection with what we've seen so far. So that was probably my very last uh, transparency for the how to fuck a presentation. And this is just a short reminder, but that's rather important in this context. And that's the so-called Brillouin theorem that I mentioned briefly, using notations that everyone should be aware of now, having followed uh, Emmanuel's presentation with these, uh, these type of operators. So stating that the single excitations are not coupled to the Hartree-Fock reference, okay, through the Hamiltonian. So this means that this matrix element is strictly zero. So that can be easily demonstrated, and I won't I won't go into the, the details of such. But that's one particular important element that I will make use of in the following. Okay, so back to Hartree-Fock theory, and let me. Again, concentrate on H2 molecule with, with the bonding orbital, the so-called Gerade orbital, and the Ungerade molecular orbital. So this one is doubly occupied. Remember, how to fuck just one single determinant. So that's Psi HF, which is the double occupancy of GU, GG bar determinant, okay? And the question that we have is that this, does this structure of a wave function survive as the internuclear distance, capital R, goes to infinity? And as we know, I mean, when you when you start stretching on the 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 the, uh, the bond length, well, what occurs is that all of a sudden the the Gerard and Ungerard molecular orbitals tends to be quasi or strictly degenerated when R strictly goes to infinity. So the question that may be raised is the following: is that should I occupy the G orbital or should I occupy the U orbital? And as you can see, I mean, the, the question has to be is not appropriate, strictly speaking, in the context of quantum mechanics, because both, both occupations can be, can, be, can be considered. And let me somehow get back into the first, in order to inspect what goes on in this, this, uh, this limit, go back into the description, back to the atomic orbital structure. So let's say that we have a A orbital localized on site, on the right-hand side, and B on the left-hand side. The Gerard orbital is simply speaking the, the linear combination, in phase combination of A and B, so that A, A plus B, whereas the Ungerad is A minus B. And if you plug that into this determinant and expand that, what you'll recover is something that has some physical contents that might be followed as, as this way. Well, this, the, so the Hartree-Fock uh, wave function can be split back into the atomic view into two electrons on site A, two electrons on site B, and these forms are naturally called as ionic because it is as if you had like an H minus ion in the contact, in contact with an H, with a proton, simply speaking, whereas those one can be referred to as neutral forms. And therefore the Hartree-Fock solution can be expanded into ionic and neutral form. And what do we expect as R goes to infinity is that evidently, well, this neutral form should survive, whereas this contribution should definitely disappear. And as you can see in the Hartree-Fock formulation, and that's probably one of the limitations that can be stated, is that this 
structure is not appropriate because as you can see, the ionic form survives all throughout the dissociation limit. Therefore, something more has to be added to the structure of the Hartree-Fock wave function. And one naive way to simply suppress that is to add another contribution, another determinant. And as you can see now, the wave function is not strictly one determinant, but rather a linear combination of those two determinants, meaning that this is the double occupancy of the G orbital or the double occupancy of the U orbital. No matter, don't worry about the signs. I mean, this is just for, for the sake of simplicity, but a linear combination is sufficient. And definitely this means that the Hartree-Fock description is insufficient. So we have to go beyond mean field. And that's what we're very much concerned about today. Okay, so that's the so-called configuration interaction. We have to go way beyond a single configuration. Let me expand back the uh, linear combination of those two in terms of the local atomic orbitals A and B. Think of 1s orbital localized on the 200 atom, for instance. And if you expand the wave function in such a way, then what you can see is that now we have something that looks like lambda minus mu. And as expected, or what we should see is that this difference should go to zero as r goes to infinity. In other words, if this is satisfied, then automatically, well, the ionic form will disappear. And that's something definitely that is expected or that is that, that we really want to achieve in order to have something that looks very much what, with what is expected is that H2 should dissociate into two hydrogen atoms. So now we have more flexibility in the sense that we have not just a single determinant, but we have two of those, and this defines the basis set. We can evaluate the matrix elements coupling these two determinants, and that is stated as a so-called, you remember, exchange integral, so that's a two electron integral. And there's another parameter that needs to be plugged in is simply speaking the energy difference between the Hartree-Fock solution and the UU bar, so the double occupancy of the antibonding orbital. And for the sake of simplicity, this energy difference is simply written as two times delta. That can be, again, evaluated very easily. And by using this, we can build up in the basis set of the GG bar and UU bar determinants, the so-called configuration interaction matrix. And by diagonalizing this matrix, we can recover what was missing in this very elementary basis set. As you can see, this is just one orbital on each side, atomic orbital on each side, but we can retrieve what of something that was missing in the Hartree-Fock description, having more flexibility in the description of the wave function. So two determinants in order to determine and to retrieve something that is physically acceptable. Okay, so let me now move on to the definition because this is something that we want to, well, to evaluate, the correlation energy. And is usually defined as the energy difference between the Hartree-Fock energy and the exact one. So the, when, you, when you evaluate this energy difference, so what is missing in Hartree-Fock is what we call correlation energy, simply speaking. Okay, that I will use this definition throughout the presentation. And that can be easily evaluated from the diagonalization of the previous matrix that I showed you. Okay, so by simply, well, well going into this two by two mat matrix diagonalization, you can evaluate the correlation energy that can subsequently be expanded in terms of the ratio of KGU divided by delta, assuming that this ratio is much smaller than one. If you carry out some expansion of the lowest root, then you can evaluate the correlation energy. And as you can see, delta being positive, this correlation is a negative. As expected, I mean, more flexibility means that the energy through the variational principle has to be lower as compared to the Hartree-Fock energy, okay? And the wave function can be re-evaluated now having a linear combination of the GG bar, so the Hartree-Fock solution and the UU bar one. So this means that the wave function consists of one part on the Hartree-Fock and some complementary part on the UU bar configuration. And this coefficient that I wrote as C1, just to remind you of first order perturbation theory, but we will get back to that is simply speaking the ratio between KJU, so the matrix 
the off-diagonal matrix elements divided by the energy difference between these two, so the GD bar energy and the UU bar expectation energy. Okay, and that's something that we'll we will we will see later on. So this coefficient tells you how much of the mixing you have between these two, so the Hartree-Fock solution and the double occupancy of the U orbital. Okay, so now we have some elements. Well, having the full, well, diagonal, exact diagonalization, which is very, very standard in this context because it's a two by two matrix. And we can also make use of, well, expansion. And that will lead us to, uh, to perturbation theory. But more in terms of generalization, what we call configuration interaction. And I will. In, in, the, in the coming slides quite often use the so-called intermediate normalization uh, uh, work condition, meaning that psi, the exact wave function, is expanded as a linear combination of the reference, so that's the Hartree-Fock. And as you can see, I set the, the C naught, so this, uh, the amplitude on the psi naught, the wave function, the Hartree-Fock solution, as equal to one, for the sake of simplicity. Okay, that's a, that's a very standard way to write, write things down. So that these are the single excitations using the formalism that has been introduced by Emmanuel Fromager in the previous lecture, that this belongs to the double excitations and so on, okay? And if you project the Schrodinger equation onto psi naught, well, what you can see immediately is that the energy is not just the Hartree-Fock energy, but it has also some complementary contribution and that is, strictly speaking, using the definition that I gave previously, the so-called correlation energy. And interestingly, the correlation energy depends on the amplitude of the double excitations. So this class of determinants, that's something that will be somehow some sort of a guide in, the, in all this lecture. So the, the whole matrix uh, configuration interaction matrix can be written down on the basis of the reference determinant, so that's the Hartree-Fock determinant, single excitation, double excitation, etc. And as you can see, there are some zeros over here. Well, this one is very expected, and that's, simply speaking, Brillouin's theorem telling you that the, the, the matrix elements between psi naught and single excitation is strictly zero. These other zeros have to do with the so-called Slater rules that I have introduced well, knowing that the full Hamiltonian H consists of a one electron part and two electron parts. And therefore, well, the Slater rule tells you that well, this matrix is not so sparse, I would say, but there are some zeros that we can anticipate simply, well, from mathematical rules. The problem still is that the size of the matrix grows exponentially because the number of electrons that you can accommodate in a given set of molecular orbitals has the exponential growth. And you can rather easily, even on small system, reach up to several millions of configurations. So by no way you can diagonalize such matrix and it's using standard exact diagonalization techniques. So some, some tricks have to be found and there are some, evidently some, some, some solutions or elements or, that, that have to be introduced in order to, well, to retrieve what was missing, so, and strictly speaking, the so-called correlation energies. One way to do that is to restrict to single and double excitation. So just you know, take a, a chunk of this, of this matrix and go through the diagonalization. But even if you do that, then the, the number of determinants can be huge, and this can be a rather demanding calculation overall. But just to give you some acronyms, this is a very standard in the context of quantum chemistry, and um, some calculations are carried out through truncations with problems that I may that I may mention later on. But this would be the so-called configuration interaction single and doubles. Okay, so that would be well excluding. That's a rather rough approximation, as we may think of, but in some circumstances you can you can retrieve part or some part of the of the correlation energy in a, in a much cheaper way. Okay, so that was the, let's say the first strategy going through the uh, 
diagonalization, so using the variational principle that leads you introducing the basis set, some sort of a diagonalization. Well, but we know that diagonalization can be very expensive, as you saw, I mean, the, the, the number of determinants is, can be very large, and by no way we can go through the exact diagonalization procedure. So an, an alternative to that would be to use perturbation. And let me briefly somehow get back into the perturbation theory coming from quantum mechanics. And the idea is the following, I'm sorry, is the following, is that when we want to solve some sort of a problem that is a Schrodinger-like equation uh, resolution and splitting somehow or partitioning the, the Hamiltonian into some H naught part plus some V part. And that is to be considered or thought as some sort of a perturbation. So this means that, let's say the matrix elements or the, the amplitude of this, uh, of this operator is controlled by some lambda parameter and lambda is much smaller than one. That's one way to state things. Okay, you should. And that's precisely the case that we will stick to in particular, so assuming that most of the physical ingredients are contained into H naught. Um, let us assume that we know the solution of H naught. So we know how to solve that by some ways, either using some, well, some analytical ways or some cheap uh, calculations. We, we know the solution. So this means that we have, the, we know the spectrum of H naught. And I will stick to the non-degenerate case at first. V is considered as a perturbation and we'll see that knowing the amplitudes and the, the, uh, the eigenvalues and eigenfunction of H naught will lead us to a, to a very elegant way of determine, determining the, the eigenvalues and eigenvectors of the exact H Hamiltonian. Okay, so I will somehow get back into some general results coming from quantum mechanics in terms of perturbation theory. And the idea is to go through step-by-step -step identification of the terms in the Schrodinger equation. So I skip the details for obvious reasons, but this can be found in many different excellent textbooks. So this is just somehow getting back to some general results. So the zeroth order tells you that the energy, so the zeroth order energy of some state alpha, any, any alpha, it doesn't have to be the ground state, but any state alpha is given by the unperturbed value of this, uh, of this uh, ground state energy. So that is the eigenvalue of the H naught operator. So that would be for the zeroth order. At first order, well, what we know, or what we find in perturbation theory is that the, the first order energy correction is simply speaking, the expectation value of the perturbation. Okay? Remember W is nothing but V, introducing this uh, lambda parameter, but this is just the, how much the, the, uh, the perturbation acts on, on, the, on the unperturbed state. Alpha is unperturbed, okay? And that would be the uh, wave function correction at first order. At second order, well, I will stick to the, uh, to the energy correction because this will be mostly what we will be interested in in the following, is that the energy correction is given by the square, as you can see, this is just the matrix elements times the Hermitian conjugate, so that's the square of this matrix elements, divided by the energy difference between the beta state and alpha state. So alpha state is the state that I I'm concentrating on, and beta are quite often called as perturbers. So these are all the other states. And as you can see, the sum runs all through beta, beta being different from alpha for obvious reason. Okay, and you can go third order, et cetera, et cetera. But I will stick essentially to second order perturbation theory. Okay, some, some important remarks on this second order energy correction that I rewrote using the V, V being the, the perturbation to the H naught uh, Hamiltonian. So as you can see, that's the zeroth order. So that would be the first order energy correction. So this is the expectation value of the perturbation in the unperturbed state. And that's the second order energy correction up to second order. This is what we have, okay? And very interestingly, and I think that's the beauty of this, uh, of this, uh, of this uh, theory, is that all corrections, all energy corrections, are given by the unperturbed eigenvalues and eigenfunctions, so the alpha and the E naught alpha, as you can see in this formula. That's very important. So this means that as soon as you get information on the unperturbed, so the H naught Hamiltonian, then you can expand the exact 
eigenvalues in terms of these ingredients that you that you know okay and one more probably interesting point of information that i would like to emphasize is that if the energy e naught alpha is smaller than e naught beta so this means that you have a higher lying beta state then automatically it pushes lower in energy the alpha state and that's what i wrote over here alpha state is stabilized and that's the origin of some phenomena that probably you're aware of depending on whether you're spectroscopist or physicist or chemist okay that's something rather important and consequences that i that i mentioned probably there are many other ones okay so let me now introduce something using what we've seen and trying to find or to look into this uh, perturbation effect in a slightly different way to highlight the importance of correlation so everything that goes beyond Hartree-Fock theory so we, for that I will assume that the energy difference between the the target space or so the alpha state energy difference with any other perturbers is delta so this means that there's some sort of a state that is clearly identified and way somehow above lies some all the other states and the energy separation is delta and that's a constant for all alpha for all i'm sorry beta that should be beta excuse me well the second order perturbation theory which was the the term that i highlighted be before is just a summation of a beta different from alpha and assuming that these denominators are all the same, delta, then you can sum up all the beta terms and subtract the one that was, uh, that was included, okay? So that's the approximation stands for the fact that here I, I, I assume that the energy difference here are all the same, okay? But this is just uh, having all the beta terms minus, minus the one that has been reintroduced somehow. And by there is elementary uh, recombination of this expression. Yes, Emmanuel? Yeah, sorry. Somebody is asking about the notations. Um, so, uh, about alpha and beta. Do you hear me? Or there's so many questions. Yes, I can, I can hear you, Emmanuel. Yeah. Okay. So somebody is asking, uh, like beta in fact corresponds to an excited state, right? In yes. Yeah. That, that can be an excited state, but as, as I said, I mean, in general, where in principle, alpha doesn't have to be the ground state. I mean, it can be any, any other states. So you can just, there's a target space and you're interested in all other states and how, how these other states affect this particular one. And that was the dimension of my second comment over here, is that if, and there's a, there's a big if over here, is that if the energy of the alpha state is lower than the perturber beta, so indeed, in that case, beta is an excited state, then alpha is automatically stabilized. But if you were to, to somehow concentrate on the beta state, then that would be the other way around. That means that the, the alpha state would push up the, uh, the, the beta state higher in energy. And that makes the so-called avoided crossing because you get those two states and one is pushed up and the other one is pushed down. Okay, so they tend to avoid each other somehow. So this is where this uh, terminology comes from. So Lucas, did okay. the uh, answer your question. your question? I guess, yes. Okay. Okay, you can continue. Okay. Yes. Okay. Okay, so using this, uh, this expression and by simply well, rewriting this, uh, in particular this um, matrix element squared, what you can observe is that then you get a summation over all states, over all beta. And as you may know, this is the so-called closure relation, relation or identity resolution. So this is just identity operator. And all of a sudden you're left with the second order energy correction. That is something that is just the square, the, the, uh, the expectation value of the square of the perturbation minus the expectation value squared of the perturbation. And that's something that we know about in terms of statistics. And this has to do with fluctuations, okay? In other words, correlation energy by using, well, this some sort of a approximation of, of view, a little bit simplified, but that's something that has some general, well, general statement. That's, well, correlation energy is a measure of fluctuations, at least at this level of approximation. So I stick to second order energy correction. So what is missing in particular in the Hartree-Fock approximation 
is indeed the fluctuation. So this is the, the title of the, of the presentation today, is that the instantaneous electron, electron interaction. You remember Hartree-Fock was mean field approximation. So mean field means that there's averaging, and what is missing are indeed, in, in, the, in view of this particular relation, are the, the fluctuations. Okay, so back to our, uh, our views. So we started with Hartree-Fock last or some weeks ago, and those single reference. And in this context, I mean, these, the, the application of perturbation theory to Hartree-Fock is called the so-called, is the molar plus perturbation theory. So MP, MP something, and I will stick to MP2, two standing for second order. Okay, so let me get back to notation. So the exact Hamiltonian is split into two parts, so the H naught and the V part. And the, the, the reference, so the alpha state is the one I'm inter interested in, is the Hartree-Fock solution that has been determined through the, uh, the Hartree-Fock calculations. So this means that H naught is nothing but the, the Fock operator and summing up over all the electrons, okay? Capital N is the number of electrons in the system. And the perturbation is just the, the difference between the electron-electron interaction. So there's a, there's a one half that shouldn't be here. I'm sorry, I apologize for that because they, oh no, that's okay, that's okay. Minus the Hartree-Fock potential, okay? So this is a, well, if you plug that back into here, well, you recover the exact Hamiltonian. So we know that the Hartree-Fock potential is a one electron operator. And this is the true, the, 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 the re, well, the, the two electron operator acting. So what do we know using the um, perturbation theory? Well, the E naught is just the expectation value of the Hartree-Fock energy for the H naught value. So this is just a summation. This is a one electron operator. So summing up the occupied, um, the occupied orbital energies, okay, and we know let me emphasize or stress on that, is that E naught is not the Hartree-Fock energy. You remember that was this, when you sum up these, there's a double counting of the electron-electron interactions. But this is not H, this is H naught, right? Using perturbation theory. What if we include first order energy correction? Well, we saw that the first order energy correction is nothing but the expectation value of the unperturbed state, the Hartree-Fock state, for the uh, perturbation V, and V in that case is this particular contribution. And when you expand that, well, you retrieve something that is that we saw last week, is that this is the, well, the correction for the double counting of the electron-electron interactions. In other words, summing up E0 and E1, so this means that at first order uh, energy correction, then the, the you retrieve the Hartree-Fock energy. Okay, E0 plus E1 is, the, simply speaking, the Hartree-Fock energy. But we, we want to go beyond that, evidently. And the second order is using the definition that I gave previously, is the expectation value, is the square of the expectation value of the matrix and the, 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 the coupling matrix elements divided by the energy differences, okay? And E0, again, again is the Hartree-Fock reference energy. Is the, I'm sorry, is, the, is this quantity over here. And what are the, those beta Continual determinants, well, these are all the perturbers that you can think of, and using this uh, generation uh, scheme, these are the single excitation, double excitation, triple excitation, et cetera, et cetera, okay? And we have to plug that in, evaluate in order to evaluate the second order energy correction. Well, thanks to two important theorems, so the first one is the Brillouin theorem that I re-mentioned at the very beginning, and Slater rules, Keeping in mind that the Fock operator is a monoelectronic uh, uh, operator, well, we know that this matrix element is zero, and all these matrix elements are also zero. And when I say all these, this means that any quadruple excitation, quintuple excitation, exopole excitation, well, this automatically will give zero. So this means that it, in this apparently very long list, the only important perturbers so the beta that I mentioned previously are the red ones. So the double excitations are the only ones that give some non-zero matrix elements for the numerator, okay? And therefore, I will you can easily evaluate the, the unperturbed energy of those uh, perturbers 
So these ABRS excitations, and these are simply, well, these are just one electron energy evaluation. So this is very straightforward. And by plugging that into the, the second order energy correction, well, what you can find is the so-called MP2, so molar placenta at second order energy correction that gives you something that can be considered as an estimation of the correlation energy. And as you can see, and that's rather important again, is that once you know the Hartree-Fox solution, well, you know all these quantities, these are the eigenvalues, so you can easily evaluate those differences, so the denominators, whereas the, numer the numerators are just these matrix, uh, matrix elements that, that need to be squared in order to evaluate the MP2. One last piece of information that I would like to, to stress is that, well, strictly speaking, V is the perturbation, but you can simply replace V by H minus H naught. And due to the structure of H naught being a monoelectronic Hamiltonian, well, these, as you can see, I mean, there's absolutely no difference. You can use either V or H, and that's gonna be rather important in particular Emmanuel Fromager's present subsequent presentation, okay? So interestingly, just run a Hartree-Fock calculation, retrieve all these energies. So this is something that, that, that you get out of the calculation immediately. And these matrix elements can be easily evaluated. And as you can see, at very cheap cost of calculation, you can retrieve some estimate of the correlation energy. Well, evidently, well, those energy denominator should be different from zero. So as you can see, these energy differences should not be too small. And what too small means, I won't get into too many details regarding that. But in principle, you can have a rather, well, some source of information by simply running the Hartree-Fock calculation and plugging that into the MP2 procedure. And that's very standard in most uh, quantum chemistry codes. Well, what what if this uh, zeroth order, so the, the Hartree-Fock uh, solution is not, strictly speaking, a single reference? So that was the starting point, you remember? So we wanted something that was uh, uniquely defined. So let's say the, the hydrogen molecule at uh, close to, let's say, to equilibrium distance. But in some problems, that might not be the case, is that the zeroth order wave function might be multi-reference. And I gave you an example before that was, at, at uh, well, at the dissociation limit, well, the the H two molecule has to be depicted as a linear combination of determinants. So, if alpha is not degenerate, uh, might not be strictly speaking non-degenerate, and that's again the dissociation limit that I mentioned. Well, no, the, we just to introduce some vocabulary, where we like to speak in terms of non-dynamical correlation energy. Okay. This is not the one that I have introduced so far because I stick to, a, to a, a problem that can be depicted at zeroth order as a single reference. Okay, the Hartree-Fock solution is, is a satisfactory approximation, but we know that in some cases it might not be. And the example that I gave was the dissociation limit. Well, in that case, you may have to work a little bit harder in order to describe the full wave function, keeping in mind that even at zeroth order, you have to include more than one single determinant. And that can be rather demanding, but I, I won't say more on that. That will be essentially Emmanuel Fromager's uh, presentation. That's what we call non-dynamical correlation. Well, evidently, non-dynamical means that there are some dynamical correlation energy, and that's the one that I was uh, concentrating on. And that means that this is all that you want to retrieve, assuming or that the, the, the wave function can be reasonably depicted as as a single reference at zero fold. Something that I wrote over here, it means that the exact wave function can be projected onto the Hartree-Fock solution and that this projection is close to one. Okay, I won't give any numbers, but that would be typically the structure that you would have at describing the, the H2 molecule close to the equilibrium distance. Okay, that's some sort of a partitioning and terminology that we like to introduce in terms of non-dynamical, so that's mean quasi-degeneracy, 
as compared to dynamical correlation energy. And I suppose that Julien Toulouse in particular would speak a lot on, on, those, on those things. Are there any other partitioning? What if the zeroth order is not uniquely defined? Well, this is a, then you enter the, you know, the plethora of uh, approximation or description, but I will, I will try to somehow shed the light on, on the most, uh, the most, in, well, the, the leading ones in the context of, of a, of a, of a well-defined zeroth order uh, wave function through the Hartree-Fock uh, description. So you can combine different strategies, the two ones that I mentioned previously. So the first one, do you remember this was the CI configuration interaction calculations? So the so-called variational or diagonalization of a matrix can be combined with perturbation strategies. Okay, there are different ways and you can, you can, you can also recombine those in order to make the calculation as cheap as possible, not, not just that, but also to get some understanding of what is going on in the system and how much non-dynamical correlation is important as compared to dynamical correlation energy. Okay, and I would highly recommend you to listen carefully to Emmanuel Formazé's lecture in a, in, a, in a few minutes. Okay, so let me move on now to different partitioning and try to inspect on what's hidden somehow in this uh, description of the wave function and back to the intermediate normalization writing. So I have used these annotations quite, uh, quite a lot before and I will stick to it, okay? So back to the, let's say the simplest view where the Hartree-Fox solution, psi naught, is a reasonable, a very acceptable starting point in order to, to expand the exact wave function. I will stick to that, which is some sort of which has some sort of limitation, and that will be the, the purpose of Emmanuel's lectures coming soon. Well, if you if you if you just uh, plug that into the Schrodinger equation and and simply speaking, well, project the the Schrodinger equation onto the reference, so that would be psi naught on the singles excitations, those are those ones, the doubles in red, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Well, at you can easily get back to what I wrote before. So the so-called correlation energy, because as you can see, when you expand this uh, expression, you, then you, you end up with the E naught, summation over the matrix elements of the double occupation times the amplitudes of those, which should be the exact energy. And therefore the, the difference between those two is simply speaking, the correlation energy, and as you can see, and again, and I would like to insist on that again, is that the correlation energy is simply given as by these matrix elements that can be easily calculated numerically times the amplitudes of those double excitations. But evidently, those double excitations have to be evaluated. So this means that this is not the end of the day. I mean, this is, you have to work in order to evaluate those quantities variationally using some diagonalization using perturbation theories there are different strategies that i've just introduced before but very importantly what you can see is that correlation has to do with pairs okay let's say that we have two electrons occupying a and b orbitals and these two electrons get somehow promoted to r and s respectively and um, but these two electrons move like pairs so this reminds you very much like the lewis theory right where electrons like to make pairs and pairs makes bonds and bonds make multiple bonds. But we have something that has to do with that is inherent to the structure of the Hamiltonian that has some one electron part and two electron parts. And this is why I mentioned pair strategies. And I would like to discuss a little bit these, those things with you right now. So the first step is the probably the simplest, uh, the simplest strategy, which is the so-called independent electron pair approximation. So in a very short way, that means that we would like to look into the electronic structure as if we have pairs of electrons. But that's again, Lewis views, right? Having pairs moving somehow independently, one with respect to the other. Well, back to the correlation energy. This is just a repetition of the, of the, the writing that I have just introduced. Well, you may rewrite this quantity as a summation over E, AB, EAB being this, this particular summation. So if you plug that back into here, well, evidently you get the correlation energy. So this is just another way to view things, right? Where you concentrate the energy on some 
AB pair. Okay, concentrate on AB pair, and you can assume that these are localized or partly localized orbitals, and you want to evaluate how much of energy you retrieve by somehow allowing for fluctuation with the occupancy of this AB well, region of space that can be viewed as orbitals. Okay, and again, I would like to insist on that is that these coefficients are functions of all CI coefficients. Okay, that's something very important because at first you may just think, well, perfect. I mean, we know the answer. We know the correlation energy. But, but the true answer is, well, you have to work on that and evaluate those quantities. So let me define the EAB, uh, well, correlation energy. So that would simply be, I mean, this is something that is physically understandable, the energy of, the, of this particular pair AB. And look, just consider or think of a, of a of a pair of electrons in some region of space, like a, for instance, a CH bond, for instance. And if you go through this uh, evaluation of the correlation energy, you enter the, the world of the so-called independent electron pair approximation. And I will briefly introduce you to that, okay? So the first thing is how do we evaluate the, or how do we calculate these uh, correlation energies, I mean, the, all these quantities, and the number of those is simply speaking by, well, the number of pairs, so it's just n times n minus one divided by two, because this, this is just the number of pairs that you have, assuming that the total number of electrons is just capital N. Well, this is a little bit, uh, a little bit of, of rewriting, simply speaking, but we may just write the, uh, the pair function as a contribution on the Hartree-Fock uh, reference energy and the summation over those. Okay, that's the way we write the uh, the pair energy. So as you can see, I mean, A, B are frozen somehow. So this is mean one pair that you concentrate on and you allow excitation from this pair. And I stick to, for simplicity, to double excitation. Okay, I leave out all the other excitations. And as you can see, this can be viewed as a restricted CI, a truncation of a CI expansion. Okay. I just look into some pair function and while well, expanding that particular function using intermediate normalization as a summation over the, those, those, um, those, uh, those, uh, those contributions. Okay, so if you go through that, use the standard strategy that we have used uh, many times onto psi projection onto the reference and the double excitation, you enter a set of equations that can be solved and evaluates through this uh, strategy the so-called correlation energy in the context of independent electron pair approximation by summing up all these contribution EAB. I won't set up the equation for that, but this, as you can see, interestingly, the equations are such that the, there's a coupling between the, the excitation between the AB to RS and the AB to TU. So this means that's some sort of a coupling between these but again, and very importantly, is that this has to do with a given pair of electrons, so two electrons occupying A and B orbitals. So this can be restated somehow in a matrix form, but I don't want to detail that so much, just to introduce you shortly to pair functions construction. So interestingly, well, there's the, it looks very similar to the, you remember what I call the, uh, configuration interaction restricted to double excitation. Well, it is similar equations, even though the, well, the, the way we treat that is, uh, is much smaller somehow, so it's less demanding. Well, the, and the, the evaluation of the, uh, of the EAB is indeed variational. So this means that you get the, the, lowest, uh, the lowest energy that you can think of, but summing up those doesn't guarantee that you get something that is variational for the correlation energy. So that's something that you should be aware of. And the problem is that there's no coupling between two pairs. So this is why we call this independent pair approximation, okay? So this means that we want to treat pairs of electrons independently somehow, or sometimes this is referred to as pair at a time. And the probably the most important problem that I, I don't have much time to discuss on that, but just to, to highlight this particular point is that this method is not invariant under molecular orbitals rotation, which is, which, is, which, is a, which is a real problem because when you start you know, playing with orbitals, if you make some linear combination of orbitals, well, 
then you, you, you enter a severe problem where the energy changes significantly. And no one wants to, any method to be dependent on the choice of the molecular orbitals. Otherwise, uh, this, is not, this is not a robust strategy. So that's one important problem of independent electron pair approximation method. Let me just to somehow make contact with what we said, in particular coming from Moller plus set second order, so MP2 uh, calculations, make contact with what we've seen. So if you if you get back to the to the previous equation that I that I showed you, so let me just uh, get back to those two equations. Well, and make t equal r and u equal s in those equations, and these are probably the leading contribution. So r equal s and t equal u. Well, what you can ev easily evaluate is the pair energy that goes like, simply speaking, this, this can be easily retrieved from those two equations that I wrote previously, assuming that this quantity is much smaller as compared to that one. So this can be neglected somehow. And this is why it can be approximation through this relation. Okay, and interestingly, well, if you assume that these, these denominators are nothing but the energy differences of, this, of the one electron energies, the one that you get from the Hartreffer calculation, what you can see, summing up those EAB, well, the correlation energy using this uh, independent electron pair approximation is just the MP2, the one, the energy that you get from perturbation theory at second order, okay? So there's a strong link between these I mean, uh, treating those uh, things in, in some ways, independent electron pair approximation. And as you can see, well, throughout some sort of approximation, but these are definitely the leading contributions. When you retrieve something that we've seen, this is the, the Muller plus set, the, the second order Muller plus set expansion of the energy. So there's a connection between these two. And that's something that I wanted to highlight because that will that is the, some sort of guide. So we want to improve that. Well, in particular, because we have this terrible drawback that is the non-invariance of the of the approach uh, by any change of the molecular orbitals so we want to 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 cure that problem and let me somehow inspect what do we have in the ci simple and doubles expansion so again and again writing down the wave function in such a way hartree fox single excitation double excitation using this uh, this um, these notations again well, perturbation theory is in, indeed instructive, and why is that? Well, because in these, these matrix elements, you remember using perturbation theory can be evaluated using those quantities. So these would be the numerators. And this means that, that these, these quantities are depends on, well, directly define those amplitudes. So this means that when you go through a CI single and doubles, well, you get order two to the energy through these, the evaluation of those quantities. So this means that by carrying out a CI configuration interaction diagonalization matrix restricted to single and doubles, automatically you reach something which is equivalent to order two to the energy. But you get more than that, actually, because you get also some couplings. You remember this off diagonal that you have in this uh, CI matrix. So this means that you get these matrix elements coupling that can be that retrieve part of the order three also to the energy. So this is this means that somehow a truncation of a CI up to second order is not equivalent to a second order perturbation theory. You get more using a CI calculation because you get part of all the three. And as you can see, it's just part of all the three. The reason is that well, we don't get triple excitation because we decided to leave them out. So we just but still. If you compare that to a to a perturbation theory, you get part of the second of the third order to the to the energy. So that's it. comparison. I mean, comparing diagonalization, so truncation of a CI matrix, as compared to to a um, to a perturbation theory. Uh, well, if we if 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 you if you expand more, I mean, the the the, the wave function, then and project that onto on in particular the double excitation. Well, you may end up with something that looks like that, and that would that I, that's something that I would like to highlight or detail a little bit more. So this is just rewriting the Schrödinger equation, projecting the onto the double excitation. So capital I in this context stands for a double excitation, A B to R S. 
And as you can see, there's a matrix elements over here that couples the two double excitation. And the alpha are all other types of excitation. So this means that any determinants alpha stands for a single excitation, a triple excitation, quadruple, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Okay, nothing else. Nothing. And here I just plug the ij. So this means that j is a similar. To, so that's a double excitation. I just want to highlight on this particular contribution. Okay, so that will be very useful for the forthcoming. In particular, can we think, and that's the idea of a factorization in this kind of expansion, can we think of a decoupling of this generation scheme? So when I mean generation means that you get first order, so the single excitation, double excitation, triple excitation, quadruple excitation. Can we think of a way to, let's say, to, to, to generate all these excitation in a slightly different way? And let me, for that, concentrate on the quadruple excitation. So quadruple excitation, can it be seen as a product of double excitation amplitudes? Okay, I remind you that I and J stands for amplitudes of CI and CJ stands for amplitudes of double excitation. So one way to look at the problem is that, well, what if I do have like some sort of an excitation on some part of the molecule and another excitation, double excitation standing on the other part of the amplitude. What you may naturally say is that, well, as a result, I do get something that looks like a quadruple excitations, but these double excitations are totally independent somehow. I mean, physically, this is rather acceptable. And the idea is that, can I generate those amplitudes, so the quadruple excitation as product of double excitation product. Okay, and that's the philosophy of the so-called couple clusters. So another pair theory that I have just introduced that extends somehow the independent pair approximation. And as you can see now, pairs moving out, moving in, are not, no longer independent because we want to couple them through this kind of equation. But is that true? But we will see that. So let me concentrate on some quadruple excitation, A, B, C, D to R, S, T, U, okay? We start from psi naught and we carry out the quadruple excitation. And as you may see, there are different ways to do that, right? We may generate a quadruple excitation as such by carrying out first the excitation from A, B to R, S, and in a second step from C, D to T, U. That would be root number one. But there's another root, obviously, that would be to first generate the CD to TU and then AB to RS. So that would be root number two. And as you can see, these two roots may interfere. And that's the idea of having like, you know, like two beams of light interfering. So this is a, and there might be other roots, but I won't get into, into too many of those. But just to highlight the fact that there's one, one, one children, one, one child, I'm sorry, one child, simply speaking, has two parents, right? which is something that is very accepted, right? So, but, but to make connection with that, how this, how this gets translated into perturbation theory? Well, you can evaluate using these two roots, you can evaluate the amplitude of C alpha, so the amplitude of the quadruple excitation by simply plugging in what we've just learned, second order perturbation theory. Okay, so the amplitude of the, the, the wave function that goes from IEB to RS is given by the matrix elements divided by the excitation energy. So the, diff, the energy, is remember the energy difference between the reference energy and the, the perturbative energy, the one that I call delta E1, and that would be for root number two times the target that you get to, which is the quadruple excitation energy, which is the, this contribution over here. And by simply well, factorizing this, you get this sort of expression. That can be simplified in such a way that if you assume that the excitation energy of the quadruple, ex of the quadruple determinants is just the sum over these two, and that's the very first statement that I made, is that if, if these two excitations are far away, then you can easily understand that the energy that, that takes to go from AB to RS is 
independent of the energy that you have to go from uh, from CD to TU, and therefore you can sum up these two energy into delta E alpha. So the energy of the quadrupole excitation is just the energy of the independent of the of the two ex double excitations, delta E1 and delta E2. And by, by, by plugging that into this relation, what you end up with, with is simply that C alpha is the product of the amplitudes of the double excitation. And that's precisely what we wanted to reach. So this means that when you generate the wave function step by step, there's a natural way to generate excitations of higher order using the information that you had at lower order, meaning that a quadrupole excitation can be written as a product of double excitations. And that's extremely efficient somehow because this allows you for a factorization and separability somehow. Because if you think of an AB system, then the wave function of psi of the full system consisting of, of A and B is just the, the product of these two, psi I times psi B. And that's the essence of the cluster form of the wave function. And I think that I, I, I would not, well, I don't evidently have time to go any further, but one way to make those things very compact would be to start with some sort of an exponential ansatz for the wave function, writing down the exact wave function as an exponential, ex, uh, an exponential expansion acting on psi naught, T1 standing for the single excitation generation and T2 standing for the double excitation operator generations. And that's one very compact and efficient way to write the, uh, the wave function. Okay, the, well, if we, if we go back into the, um, the, the equation that I wrote previously, well, what you may observe is that the quadruple excitation C alpha being a product of the double excitation, well, there's a systematic cancellation of some terms coming from this contribution and from those coming from here for a very simple reason. So this means that there is a systematic suppression of some of the D excitation contribution. And that's something very important, but, but again, unfortunately, I don't have much time to go into too many details. But this can be seen by simply plugging the relation that I would that we have demonstrated previously. The problem with this method, I would say, and that would be very not fair to not conclude on that because it seems to be a very compact way to introduce the uh, the couple cluster expansion of the wave function, is that it is not a variational method, and not just that, but it's also very demanding in terms of calculation cost. Some conclusions before uh, before Emmanuel uh, takes the lead. Well, perturbation was used as a guide. Well, starting from the CI the configuration interaction matrix, or um, that allows us to retrieve the correlation energy, so um, the energy that is missing in the Hartree-Fock description, and that was used as the definition. And perturbation, well, as not opposed to variational or diagonalization method, but it can be used, and that's something that I showed you as a and combine. And some methods actually use, and Emmanuel will say a few words on that, that combine perturbation and variational treatment in order to build up the, the, the correlation energy or the wave function. And uh, I, I somehow say a few words very briefly, but just to give you a flavor of this uh, CCSD, so couple clusters, simple and double, which are sometimes considered as benchmark calculation for methods because they are considered the, well, the gold, gold cal well, calculations in terms of accuracy, even though they're rather uh, demanding. Okay, size consistency and size extensivity. I won't say more than that, and this is a, this is part of the um, of, of, of questions that can be raised uh, later on and that we may answer. But this is also something that is inherent to this method, and that sometimes makes also the differences, advantages, and, uh, and drawbacks of, of the reference of the, the respective ones. I think it's time for me to conclude. I would like to warmly thank you for well attending this uh, lecture and time for now to, to Emmanuel, Emmanuel Fromager to continue on that. Thank you very much. So I hope you can hear me and see my, my slides. Yes. 
So I have also a, a pointer. So yeah, it should work. Can you hear me? It's okay. Yes. Okay. Good. Okay. So thank you very much, uh, Vincent, for uh, warming up the floor for me. Um, all right. So basically, um, so Vincent has explained to you um, how you can refine the construction of a many-body wave function by incorporating uh, like excitations from a reference, which was uh, like the hotter fog determinant. And uh, so you can do that either in a configuration interaction way or using many body perturbation theory. And uh, this factorization idea, which is uh, something very smart to do and which is connected to couple cluster theory as Vincent mentioned, uh, is very important because you can push the treatment of electron correlation, okay? All right, so what I want to talk about now is something that Vincent has been mentioning uh, several times is, uh, so just asking these questions, uh, sorry, asking the questions, um, what if hot refock is not a good starting point? So do we have to th throw all of this to the trash or how, how, how can we proceed, okay? And this is connected to the so-called strong correlation problem, uh, which is a problem not only for quantum chemists, but also in condensed matter physics. We have uh, different ways of uh, tackling this kind of problem, I mean, in chemistry and physics. And I will try to describe during uh, the next hour what is uh, kind of the state of the art, at least in, in quantum chemistry, okay? So, uh, well, if you ask me uh, the question, uh, which textbook would you recommend? So my answer is the same as last week. Uh, well, this is the book, the so-called Pink Bible, as some people call it. So by Trygve Helgaka, Paul Jorgensen, and Jeppe Olsen. And uh, well, there's a lot in, about the single reference methods that Vincent mentioned, and that we usually refer to as post hartree methods, but also about all the so-called multi-reference techniques that I will tell you about uh, now. Okay, so this is the program. Uh, well, Vincent and I like very much the H2 molecule. It's, I think, our favorite toy system. So I will uh, basically review very briefly what Vincent told you, uh, showing some curves. So it, it will make a little break. And, um, but then I will focus on, on, on something that uh, was not mentioned before, which is the problem of the orbitals. So I'll try to draw your attention to the calculation of orbitals, which is gonna be something very important when you turn to a so-called strongly correlated system. So, uh, and, uh, so I will motivate so the, the second part of, of the presentation, which will be about orbital optimization. And uh, so I will introduce you to the concept of orbital rotation. So optimizing orbitals is something uh, similar to a rotation process as we will see. And finally, uh, at the end, I will try to give you a general picture about the, so this uh, state of, of the art method for strongly correlated molecules, that we call complete active space self-consistent field, so CASA-CF. Uh, discuss a little bit how you can extend the, the, the theory to, uh, to excited states and, uh, and tell you about perturbation theory on that basis, exactly as uh, Vincent mentioned. Okay, so this is our menu and, uh, and uh, yeah, we'll start now. Okay, so I will uh, start by mentioning, I think repeating probably uh, what uh, Vincent has been telling you about the, the H2 molecule uh, in a more graphical way, but the content will be more or less the same. Uh, and I will try just to complement a little bit uh, what Vincent said. So what you have under your eyes now is a potential energy uh, curve for the H2 molecule. So I just try to decipher a little bit uh, what that means. Well, first of all, I, I discuss here only the ground state of the of the molecule. So uh, this is the this the spectroscopic uh, notation. This barbarian name uh, augmented CCPVQZ, so so called quadruple zeta basis set. So this is a large basis set composed of diffused uh, orbital functions. The reason why I highlight this is because you will see later on that this will actually have an impact on the quality of the orbitals you get from the hard calculation, okay? So I will come back to that, but uh, that's important to, to remember. So what I'm plotting here is just uh, the total energy of the molecule, so the, the quantum energy of the electrons plus the classical uh, nuclear repulsion, okay? And I study how this varies with respect to the bond distance. Okay, so in black, this is uh, 
the full configuration interaction, so uh, full CI as we call it, and uh, in a more uh, physics way of talking about things, this is just the exact organization. So Vincent was showing this uh, CI uh, matrix with all the excitations. So in that case, of course, you would only have like a single and double excitations. So the idea you construct the full matrix and you diagonalize it exactly, okay? And you, so you do that in the basis of the determinants that you generate from uh, your hard for for calculation, okay? So it's basically exact in the uh, atomic orbital basis you consider, all right? So this is the, the black guy. So uh, what I'm interested in here is what happens when you stretch the bond. And uh, more, actually, I'm more interested in the dissociation process. So of course, as Vincent mentioned, in principle, if everything is all right, when you break the bond, you should get at the end two uh, neutral uh, hydrogen atoms, okay, in their ground state. And uh, well, that's what you see on the curve here because minus one half is the energy of a single hydrogen atom in atomic units. So if you have two atoms, you get minus one, okay? So everything works as you would expect if you do the full CI. Well, if you do hard refoc, well, you can see the curve. Uh, well, something goes really wrong, okay? When, uh, when you dissociate, when you break the bond, uh, because you're far away from, uh, from the exact result. So we'll try to understand a little bit more what, what is happening. And uh, well, Vincent actually gave the answer uh, before. So what happens is if you uh, work in a restricted hunter fog framework, because this is what I, we're talking about here, okay? It means that basically you assign, uh, so, uh, so the two electrons are in the same orbital, okay? One electron has been alpha, the other has been beta, but they occupy exactly the same orbital, which is this Gerardo orbital, okay? This is a bonding orbital that I denote here uh, one sigma g, uh, and that's it. So I wrote the notation in second quantization, but if you go back to first quantization, if you just look at the part that depends on the coordinate of the electrons, this is simply the product of uh, this bonding orbital, one sigma g, evaluated for coordinates of the first electron and then the second electron. Okay, so this is what you get if you do the hard for calculation because you work with a single uh, Slater determinant. That's the idea of this approximation. So uh, yeah, as Vincent mentioned, so he called uh, uh, the SASB, he called it A and B. Okay, these were these localized orbitals. So these are S orbitals. And uh, so the sigma g is a bonding orbital, okay? So it's plus combination of two s orbitals, one localized on one hydrogen atom and the other on the other. So if you uh, expand then the Slater determinant on that basis, what you get is exactly what was mentioned by Vincent. So you get uh, four terms, two of them are perfectly physical, like you have one electron on each hydrogen. So you get what you want, but you have this uh, residual uh, ionic forms, okay, that appear. And uh, which means that you end up in a situation where electrons can be on the same atom, and this is unphysical. So this actually brings you large electron repulsion, which is completely uh, artificial. And this is the reason why you get this high energy, okay? So you're completely off because you uh, get these uh, ionic contributions to the wave function that should not be there, okay? So a consequence of that is uh, when you evaluate the correlation energy that Vincent talked about, you realize that it's quite large. I mean, the deviation from, uh, from the full CI is huge. And you see it increases now with the bond distance. So, and this is what we call, uh, that what we will call in chemistry a strongly correlated uh, system because the, the correlation energy is quite strong, okay? Uh, so, and uh, what's interesting to see is in this case, what happens if you apply perturbation theory based on Hunter-Fock, so which Vincent uh, called MP2, okay? So MP2 relies on Hunter-Fock. So if Hunter-Fock sucks, you can expect that MP2 is not gonna perform very well. And, and that's exactly what you see. So you see MP2 gets completely crazy when you start to tr stretch the bond. One of the reason, uh, if you remember the, the formulas from perturbation theory of Vincent, you had energy differences in the denominator. So uh, in fact, if the homolumal gap gets small, which is exactly what's happening in this case, well, your denominator is gonna be like very close to zero. So uh, somehow the perturbation theory explodes and you get completely unphysical results. So that's what's happening. 
So what you learn from this is that, uh, yeah, for sure, hard to focus is not a good starting point in that story. So all these strategies that try to describe correlation starting from hard to fork are not necessarily good ones if your system is strongly uh, correlated. Okay, um, in chemistry, um, this strong correlation thing is often referred to as static correlation or non-dynamical. So now if I try to make a connection with the, what Vincent told you, he said, correlation is essentially uh, a problem of fluctuation. Well, you realize here that you're so far away when you are in a hard trace of approximation, you're so far away from the full CI that these are not really fluctuations, okay? So this kind of correlation, it is a correlation effect because correlation includes everything that comes after hard trace, okay? But this part, this error is so large that you cannot consider it as fluctuations. So this is why this has nothing to do really with dynamical processes with fluctuations and chemists call that static correlation, okay? So, um, or non-dynamical. Okay, so uh, if I summarize basically, why do we have troubles with hartree fock As I said, we have this bonding orbital and we double occupy it and that's it, okay? And we get these unphysical terms. Uh, what we forget here, and this was also mentioned by, by Vincent, is that um, basically you can construct, of course, also an untied bonding orbital uh, when you had the two S orbitals, okay? This is the minus combination of the S orbital. So, and if you do that, uh, well, now you have the possibility to have two configurations. Either you doubly occupy the bonding orbital or you doubly occupy the untied bonding, okay? And that's how you get what we call in chemistry a multi-configurational wave function, which is there just to describe the strongly correlated problem. All right. And uh, so again, if you uh, write more explicitly what that means in, in first quantization, so if I write explicitly how the, the, the wave function expands, okay? And uh, I remember how the bonding and the entire bonding are written. So in terms of plus or minus combinations of the atomic S uh, orbitals, if I expand this, you get rid completely of these non-physical ionic contributions. Okay, this was mentioned uh, uh, previously by, uh, by Vincent. All right, so if based on this uh, consideration here, I could think, okay, good. So uh, if I do a calculation in this limit, in this strongly correlated limit, I should uh, definitely uh, like put two electrons, with my two electrons and let them actually distribute among the, either the bonding or the undyed bonding orbitals to get the right picture, okay? And this is exactly what, uh, what I, I did here on this plot. So, uh, so this CI single and double, so it's a configuration interaction calculation. Okay, and I let my electrons distribute. So in principle, I should get these two configurations I'm talking about. So everything should be all right, okay? But when I plot the energy, you see, so this is the plot in, in red, uh, sorry, in green. Uh, well, you do not exactly get uh, the right result. So there is actually an error, a residual error which seems to contradict what I just said before, because now I should get the right configuration, okay? I have this multi-configurational wave function at hand. So, so the question now is, where is the problem? So what you should remember that when you do a configuration interaction calculation, like in um, MP2, like in couple of theory, you use Hartree-Fock orbitals. Okay, so the, the orbitals you use to do all these developments and to construct the CI metrics are the one that you get from the hardware calculation. Okay, so now if I try to understand what is happening, when you optimize the orbitals at the hardware fork level, okay, you have in your wave function this unphysical ionic contribution. Okay, and in this kind of a weird situation, you are trying to minimize the energy. So if you do that, okay, what's gonna happen? Well, somehow you're trying to reduce the impact of these uh, ionic terms here, okay? You're trying to reduce the impact of these terms, these unphysical terms on, on the energy. How can you do that? Well, if you try to get molecular orbitals that are more diffused, okay? You will somehow try to reduce the two electron repulsion. And that's exactly what is happening in the Hartree-Fock calculation. 
So if you use a large atomic orbital basis, which is a common thing to do, if you want to get a good description of correlation, okay, it means that you actually give this possibility to your orbitals to get more diffused. And somehow you reduce the impact of uh, these uh, non-ionic terms, okay? What does it mean? It means that then these S orbitals that you obtain from your Hartwell calculation actually are not pure one S orbitals. So you have these S orbitals, and if you do a CI on top, what happens? Well, you reuse these orbitals, you don't touch them, and you construct your multi-configuration wave function. So what does it mean? It means that now you dissociate properly the molecule, but your electrons on each hydrogen atoms are not in the ground state, okay? There are some contributions coming from the excited 2S, 3S, and so on, okay? And that's the reason why you have this residual error. So you did actually dissociate correctly. You have two neutral hydrogen atoms, but you don't get a ground state. Uh, I mean, your hydrogen atoms are not in the ground state. And the error is just coming from the orbitals that you actually evaluated at the Hartwig-Fock level, okay? So it's kind of crazy to see that you're trying to correct Hartwig-Fock, but in fact, the orbitals, since they come from Hartwig-Fock are still wrong and it pollutes somehow your, your results. So what's the take home message? Well, with this simple example, you realize something important is that if you're trying to construct a multi-configuration wave function, you should pay attention to the orbitals you're using. So basically, if they have been optimized at the hotter fork level, these orbitals might not be of very good quality. So you have to re-optimize them, okay? And that's uh, basically, that's a very important conclusion. And that's what I would like now to, to tell you a little bit more about. So, uh, so we're entering the second part of, a, of, the, of the lecture now, is uh, this concept of orbital optimization. So what does it mean and how do you do that, actually, okay? Uh, and I will introduce the concept of orbital rotation in, uh, in, this, uh, in this context. Okay, so uh, at the hot traffic level of approximation, I don't remember if Vincent mentioned this, but you call it sometimes. So this is a mean field calculation. And in chemistry, we call this also a self-consistent field because you have to solve the Hartree-Fock equation self-consistently, okay? So if you turn into a process, uh, to a process of, of optimization of orbitals, but now you have to do it with a multi-configurational wave function, you get what we call a multi-configurational self-consistent field. So MCSCF, okay? And uh, so that's exactly what I'm gonna try to, to tell you. Like, like how, how does it work really in practice? Okay, so I'm using now this uh, drawing uh, to, so that I can explain exactly how, how we, we re-optimize orbitals. Uh, what, what does it really mean? Okay, let's say like, I go back to the example I gave about the H2 molecule. So uh, when the hot for calculation has converged, okay, you got it, the orbitals were not correct, okay? But uh, you remember, we always work with uh, molecular orbitals that are orthogonal, orthonormal, okay? So, which is something that I'm just now drawing uh, in a very simple way, in a geometric way. So we know that the Hunter-Fock orbitals are not correct. So as I said, we have to get back to proper orbitals. So in our case, it's like we knew that we didn't have really pure 1S orbitals on the hydrogen atoms. So we need to do something to go back to the right orbitals. So if you try to draw this in a very schematic way, you could say, well, of course, I always work with uh, orthonormal uh, molecular orbitals, whatever happens. So when I will optimize them, I should be sure that I preserve the orthonormality. So in fact, you can say, well, re-optimizing the orbitals just consists in rotating them. So the concept of rotation is, is coming from that. Okay. And here I introduce, so I take a very simple example where I have two spin orbitals and I just have a single angle and I will rotate them like that, okay? But of course in the calculation, as you will see later on, you have many orbitals to rotate all together at the same time, okay? But let's keep things uh, simple. Okay, so optimizing the orbitals means rotating them, that's fine. Now the question is how we do this. Uh, so if you try to give uh, the matrix representation of this uh, rotation, so you probably know that, uh, so you, you expand the, the rotated uh, orbitals and the basis of the original uh, orbitals, okay? 
you get this uh, kind of a matrix with cosine and sine uh, functions, uh, which is a, a unitary matrix, okay? So um, now what I'm gonna do, and I will try to, to motivate that later on, uh, is to uh, say, okay, so uh, I could actually write down this, uh, this uh, transformation, so this matrix, rotation matrix, like uh, an exponential. Uh, so it looks like we are making things more complicated than they are, uh, but you will realize later on that this is actually super convenient to optimize the orbitals, okay? But let's just assume that, okay, why not? So, uh, so what does it mean? So in fact, uh, here, what I've done by using this uh, notation is I have my angle theta and it's somehow like if I was constructing a simple matrix from that angle, okay? So I have transformed the angle into a matrix in that case. And if I take uh, the, uh, the exponential, I can just give back the, uh, this uh, unitary matrix that represents the rotation. So there is a question. Since H2 only has two electrons, the CI SD should be exactly the same as full CI. No, no. So, okay, I think you misunderstood me. Um, sorry, I will go back to that question. So, Xiang uh, Huan, I'm just answering. Okay, so the, this, ah, yeah, sorry, the CI SD, yes, CI SD is full CI, okay? That's true. Now you have to be careful. This is when I write CISD22 here, uh, it means that actually I only, so I put my two electrons into only two orbitals. So this is not full CI. Of course, the full CI is the CISD. So in a, in a full CI case, you would distribute the two electrons among all the possible orbitals. So you take all the virtuals that were generated from Hartree Fock. Here it's not the case. I just take the uh, bonding and anti-bonding and that's it. So if you do the full CI, of course you get the correct result. But what I consider here, CISD22, which is what I'm talking about, is not of course full CI, as you can see, okay? This is why there is this error. The residual error would disappear if you would do a full CI. Did I answer your, your question? I hope I did. So CISD22, no, 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 no. CISD22 means, so when you do a CI calculation, okay, you generate lots of unoccupied orbitals. If you do a CISD or in this case, full CI, you will allow excitation to these all, the, all of them. When I do CI22, it means that I take my two electrons and I distribute them in two orbitals only. So I leave all most of the unoccupied empty. I will never occupy them. When you do a full CI, you occupy them. So the CISD22 is an approximation to the full CI. Okay, so, um, but that's a very important point, you're right, yeah. Okay, so this is where the problem is. So it's a truncated CI. And, and of course, if you do full CI, you allow for a re-optimization of the orbitals, but this is, that's actually our problem now, okay? So we are trying to avoid going to full CI. We're trying to find a smart way to re-optimize the orbitals. So, and that's what I, I'm gonna to try to do now with this orbital rotation thing, okay? Okay, so as I said, I constructed the matrix from that angle. So I have a, my kind of angle matrix. And if I take the exponential of it, I'm able to describe basically a rotation. So uh, by writing down uh, the matrix of a rotation, this is not a very general strategy, in fact, because now it applies to a very specific rotation of two spin orbitals. What you will see later on is that using an exponential like that is super convenient because you can actually describe all possible rotation of orbitals. So it's much more general, okay? But now I'm just showing how it works with two uh, spin orbitals. Uh, just a, a comment, but uh, you notice that if you take the transpose of that matrix, you recover minus the original matrix, okay? So it's an entire emission matrix. And when you take the exponential, of course you get the unitary uh, matrix for the rotation. Um, so another comment, when I write this exponential, this looks quite abstract, but in fact, 
you will see that in the calculation, when we use this in practice, uh, we always use expansion of the exponential, which I, I rewrote here. So it's a Taylor series, okay? And that's exactly how we do it. So I can do that for numbers, but I can also do it for matrices because you can calculate powers of matrices, okay? So you should always keep in mind that every time I'm writing this exponential, I just think about this Taylor uh, uh, expansion here. Okay, so now we'll see how powerful it is that and, and why it, it is actually convenient if I want to, uh, to uh, rotate my orbitals. So what's gonna happen, you will see, is when I have introduced this uh, angle matrix, now I'm able to rotate the orbitals uh, basically in all situations. So what do I mean? So for example, you have here in blue, the unrotated orbital, and it's a very general notation, okay? That's essentially what you would get if you start with Hartree-Fock. And then, um, so what I'm gonna show you is that you can basically rotate the orbital just by applying a quantum operator. So you see exponential minus theta hat. So the angle was a matrix before and now it became an operator. So I'm gonna show you how you can do that in second computation. And at the end, when you have applied this, uh, this operator, you get your orbital that has been rotated. So it's kind of a uh, convenient, okay? So you have this exponential minus theta hat, which is the rotation operator. So how, how does it work? Well, uh, if you uh, attended the lecture last week about second quantization, well, you already know everything because I have explained to you that if you have a one electron operator and you have its matrix representation, you can construct its version in second quantization. So uh, that's exactly what I'm doing here, okay? So uh, in, in the lecture last week, uh, we didn't have like this uh, theta PQ uh, matrix elements. We had this HPQ, which were the one electron Hamiltonian Metrics, but it's exactly the same way. So, so I have this angle matrix here that is controlling the rotation of the spin orbitals, and now I transform the angle into a quantum operator. Okay, uh, by using the second quantization formality. So, if I take this very simple example of the rotation of two spin orbitals, uh, well, I basically get this. Okay, this simple expression, and the angle theta is is just there. Okay. So it's a very compact way of actually writing uh, uh, the rotation of spin orbitals. So what is kind of nice is that uh, if you proceed that way, uh, you can rotate with a single operator. So this exponential minus theta hat is a single operator will rotate all possible spin orbitals, okay? So it's convenient, one operator rotates everything. What's really interesting is that the, the same operator actually applies also to uh, Slater determinants. Actually, it works over the entire Fox space. So what do I mean is uh, like, uh, let's say you want to construct the Slater determinant here on, on the left-hand side and you do it. So this is the second quantization way of writing things and you construct it with your rotated orbitals. And now you wonder how does it connect to the uh, Slater determinant that I would actually construct now with the unrotated orbitals. Well, as again, so you use the same operator. So you put, you apply this exponential minus theta in front of it and it's done, okay? So it's very convenient from that point of view. It's a very elegant way to, to write down the rotation of orbitals inside a Slater determinant. So it works for Slater determinants, which means that it will also work for rotating orbitals within a multi-configurational uh, wave function, okay? Which is exactly what we are interested in. So if I go back to, to the problem of H2, you remember we started from a, a CI wave function. So this uh, sing, a CI single double two two that was uh, mentioned in the question. Uh, so this very simple uh, multi-configurational wave function, but we were using uh, Hartree-Fock orbitals, okay? So in a more general way, you say, okay, I have a linear combination of uh, determinants and the coefficients, the CI coefficients are there. And uh, of course now, when I write things like that, I'm using the uh, Hartree-Fock orbitals, okay? What I would like to do now is to say, okay, no, no, I got it wrong. I want to use better orbitals. So I want to rotate them, okay? So I say now I, I, I'm constructing a CI wave function, but with new set of orbitals. And how can I do that? Well, I just said before, uh, it's actually convenient to use this exponential uh, operator because 
you can rotate the orbitals inside any Slater determinant just by applying this exponential minus theta uh, operator, okay? And it's the same operator for all Slater determinants that I was mentioning. So it means that you can just take it out, okay, in front of the summation. It does not depend on the Slater determinant. And if you do that, you recognize, well, this is exactly your initial uh, CI wave function, okay? So again, you can take a linear combination of Slater determinants, you can rotate the orbitals in all of them. So inside this uh, CI wave function, just by applying this exponential minus uh, theta. Okay. All right. So uh, you may you may say, okay, this is very nice. Uh, this is very elegant, but uh, who who cares? <laughs> well, it's nice. Okay, that's cool. The good thing is, like, uh, it's actually also convenient, and that's why people use it to implement uh, MCSF. Uh, you can actually use it to really calculate the orbitals and re-optimize the orbitals, which is exactly what uh, we are uh, interested in. So that's what I would like to show you, because that's actually the reason for uh, mentioning this uh, orbital rotation operator. Okay, so, so what do we have to do? We are in a scenario which is similar to Hoffer-Fock. We have a wave function, uh, this wave function psi, and we try to optimize the orbitals that we use to construct this wave function. And we don't know which orbitals we should use. We just know that, for example, Hartree-Fock orbitals are not good orbitals, okay? So how should we proceed? Well, we say, okay, I will uh, basically try to look at the energy and how it is affected by the rotation of the orbitals. And we'll try to minimize that energy. So this is how we're gonna find the best orbitals. This is how we, we're gonna re-optimize the orbitals starting from Hartree-Fock. So now I just use what, uh, what we learned before. So if I now write the, uh, the wave function with the exponential uh, minus theta in front, it say, okay, I rotate the orbital. So, so my energy is becoming now a function of the angle, okay? So now we can do some, uh, some algebra. So for example, uh, if you move the exponential operator from the bra to the cat, because theta is anti-hermitian, it becomes an exponential plus theta. Okay, so this is uh, just a simplification of the energy. And now what is cool is that if you remember that I can actually expand my exponential, okay? So I can expand it both exponential plus theta and, uh, and minus theta. What is kind of interesting is that now I am actually able to write down a Taylor expansion without doing any more calculation. So the Taylor expansion is coming straight out of the box, okay? And this will be super nice if I want to actually implement this method. So what I'm showing now, uh, what you see on the screen is what the, the Teller expansion, how it looks like if you stop at second order, which is usually what people do, okay? So it's a bit like doing perturbation theory through second order. So which means that you will uh, have appearing the, uh, the first order derivative of the energy, which we call the gradient and the second order derivative of the energy, which is uh, the Hessian. But here, you don't need to calculate this derivative. You don't need to derive any formula. Why? Because you just benefit from the expansion of the exponential. So they are just gaming, coming straight out of the box. So for example, you can do this little exercise, but uh, if you uh, look at the gradient, uh, if you uh, consider the simplest case where you rotate two spin orbitals, okay? I remind you, this is how the theta operator looks like. Well, you can just replace into the formula and uh, the gradient looks like that. So uh, what is that? Uh, if you look carefully, this is a coupling term. So this is exactly what Vincent was somehow showing, showing sorry, in his uh, configuration interaction matrix. So it is a coupling term between your initial wave function, CI, and then what is that? Well, this are just like a single excitation. So you, here you remove an electron from the first spin orbital and you excite towards the second one. Okay, so the gradient here is just a coupling between like uh, your reference wave function psi and then the single excitation applied to it. Okay, and then you can also get the the uh, the Hessian with a similar formula. So, but all of this is analytical. So it means that you can uh, basically program that and now you are able to actually optimize the, the orbitals. So once you have this Taylor expansion through second order, uh, you can say, okay, this is an approximation, of course, to my true energy, but that's sufficient because I'm, I'm looking for a minimum. So I just need to uh, set to zero the first order derivative. 
So if you differentiate that, you immediately see that this gives you a value for the angle theta. And uh, so, uh, so it's minus, you see, the, the gradient divided by, by the, uh, the Hessian. So what is that? Well, it says that you started from some orbitals and then you wonder how much you, do, you should rotate them. Well, the answer is just under your eyes. If you know the gradient and the Hessian, you can make a, rota a first rotation. And this is what we call a Newton step because it's not exact, of course, you truncated your expansion through second order, but you can repeat the process, okay? So you can repeat, calculate the Newton step, I mean, at each iteration. And, uh, and of course, so this is, uh, this is what I mean by iterative procedure. But, uh, but after a while, at some point, you should converge, okay? And this is how you're gonna get the final, uh, the full rotation, and then you will know what are your best, uh, uh, your best orbitals. So when you have converged, it means that the Newton step is zero. There's nothing uh, to do. There's nothing to rotate anymore. And uh, which means that, uh, well, the, the gradient is zero, okay? And uh, if you remember actually what uh, I said about the gradient, this is this coupling between the reference wave function psi and this singly excited. Well, if you set that to zero, you get what Vincent uh, referred to uh, earlier as the Briouin theorem. So it's generalized because you see that it works also if psi is a multi-configurational wave function. So the Briouin theorem is something much more general than what you have in, uh, in Hunter Park, okay? So it's a very strong property. This is the signature of the fact that you get the best orbitals in your calculation. The best means that you have minimized uh, the energy. Okay, so uh, yeah. So now if I go back to my, uh, to my H2 molecule, if now I proceed that way, so I say, okay, I have only two configurations, like the, either the sigma g w occupied or the sigma u w occupied, but now I have, so it's not full CI definitely, but now I let my orbitals relax or rotate, okay? And what will happen in that case is that you uh, remove completely this uh, residual error because you get the right orbitals. And if you check them, you will see in the calculation that yes, they became pure 1s orbitals because they were allowed to relax, so um, that's exactly the that's exactly what is happening. Okay, all right. So this was for the H two, uh, and now so now I'd like to finish with the uh, like a, a general. Oh, so there is a question. I don't understand why the Briouin theorem is not valid for any sets. Ah, okay. So, all right. So uh, imagine you start from hartree fock orbitals, uh, Quentin. So uh, when you will evaluate the gradient, it will not be zero. I mean, so, okay, don't misunderstand me. I mean, in this context, when I said that it's strongly multi-configurational, okay? So if you start in, in a general problem, let's say you start from a solution that is not the mi minimizing one, the gradient will not be zero, right? Because it's not the minimum. So it will only be zero if you are standing at the minimum. So here, what I have, I have this multi-configurational wave function, which is therefore not Hartree-Fock, because I remind you that at the Hartree-Fock level, you have a single Slater determinant, okay? And now I'm trying to find, since I'm using a multi-configurational wave function, so I'm not talking about Hartree-Fock, I'm trying to find the best orbitals. If I have this multi-configurational feature, I, the Hartree-Fock orbitals are not optimal anymore, okay? Because they do not minimize the energy. You have, you see it there. If you would allow for a minimization of orbitals, you get the right answer. So definitely, if you do not relax the orbitals, you get it wrong. So this is not the minimum. I mean, if you can decrease the energy, it means that you are not standing at the stationary point. So at the first iteration, the gradient will not be zero. It's only when you have converged, when you reach a true minimum that your gradient is zero. And when the gradient is zero, you do minimize you do fulfill, sorry, the Briouin theorem. So fulfilling the Briouin theorem means that your energy, uh, you, you found the stationary point of the energy. That's basically what I mean. Another question. So did the CI single and double two to calculation use restricted? Yes, all of this is restricted. So you're, you're right, if you are, so if you are doing Hunter Fock, in an unrestricted procedure, you would get the right dissociation, but you would break the spin symmetry. Okay, so in this case, the unrestricted Hartree-Fock is a good thing 
But in, in the general thing, if you look at open shells, uh, like in transition metals and so on, so the, uh, the unrestricted approach will not necessarily give you a proper description of the electronic structure. So, uh, so it's not, I would say, a general uh, strategy, okay? So Lucas is asking, uh, are these rotation and orbital optimization the bottleneck of multi -core? No, so the bottleneck, the true bottleneck, so I will come back to that if you want, Lucas, because, um, yeah. So uh, I will discuss about the general approach, okay? And, uh, and I will, uh, I will uh, say something about that. So, the, uh, okay. So now let's talk about the, yeah. So I would like now to give you a general picture because I talked about H2. So I'd like just to give you a more general overview, okay? On how the method works. All right. So when you do uh, uh, like an MCSF calculation in general, this is, so I'm trying to show on this slide what is happening. And then the bottleneck that Lucas is mentioning will appear more clearly. Okay, so what happens? Well, usually you have like uh, electrons which are deeper uh, in deeper shells that uh, are uh, fully occupied. So these orbitals here, these guys, for example, do not exist in, uh, in, in H2 because uh, we were taking the one as electrons, okay? So we didn't have that. But uh, let's say if you take a transition metal, you will have the 1s, 2s, deeper shells. These electrons in the calculation are so deep, you know, uh, uh, they have so low energies, but they do not, uh, they are not involved in the chemistry. So usually you keep these orbitals uh, occupied, okay? So the orbitals are doubly occupied, or the spin orbitals are singly occupied, all right? That's one thing. So then you have the collection of these orbitals, but we call active which are the orbitals in which you would distribute your electrons. So typically in the case of the H2, the bonding, the gerade and the ungerade orbitals are what we call the active orbitals, okay? So we were distributing like two electrons in four spin orbitals, if I include the spin, okay? Here on my drawing, I have like uh, several, uh, several active orbitals. And for example, I have to distribute three electrons into these orbitals. So of course you can generate like that, different configurations, which is the reason why we call this multi-configurational self-consistent field, okay? Okay, so the reason why, Lucas, you were asking about the bottleneck. So in fact, um, uh, yeah, okay, so sorry, just to finish on this. So, and then of course you have all these all the orbitals, which are called the virtuals, and like in Hartree-Fock, these orbitals will never be occupied, okay? So uh, because you distribute electrons, let's say three electrons here into these orbitals, you may generate configurations where uh, orbitals are occupied, but also other configurations where they're not, okay? Because of course you have more, much more spin orbitals than electrons. And uh, so all in all, if you make an average, this is like if your active orbitals had fractional occupation numbers. So this is why I wrote that the active orbitals are uh, partially occupied. Okay, all right, so um, so in terms of rotation, okay, uh, what happens basically is that there are various scenarios. So when you rotate orbitals, you, I remind you, this is like you're mixing them. So for example, in the general uh, MCSF approach, you could uh, rotate the inactive orbitals uh, with the active. That's one type of rotation, okay? You could also rotate the, uh, the inactive with the virtuals. You mix them until you find the best orbitals that minimize uh, the energy. And finally, um, you can also mix the, uh, the, uh, the active with the virtuals. So, uh, so Lucas, you were asking if the orbital rotation is the bottleneck. So not really, because if you look at the exponential parameter, if you expand, if you expand this exponential, you realize that uh, for first order in the angle, a rotation is essentially a single excitation. So in terms of computation, this is not that expensive, I would say, okay? So the bottleneck is not coming from, from that. The bottleneck is coming from what I'm showing now in, in this slide, is the number of configurations you will generate by distributing your electrons into the active orbitals. Because actually, if you take into account in your calculation, all the possible configurations, what is happening is that you are doing a full CI inside the active space. And of course, if this active space is large because you need to consider many orbitals, then, well, 
you, you have to do a large CI calculation. And, and if you, so if you do a full CI within the active space, I insist within the active space. So it's not a full CI at the scale of the molecule. Okay, it's not full CI, strictly speaking. It's just within the active space. And then you may get, as I said, many configurations involved. And this can be actually um, uh, demanding computationally. And this is the reason why actually in recent years, people have been focusing a lot on that. And for example, the DMRG method, so the density matrix renormalization group method uh, has become uh, pop, uh, increasingly popular in quantum chemistry for that reason, because it uh, enables you to use large active spaces, okay? So, uh, so if you actually do really this full CI within the active space, you do what we call the complete active space. So complete, because you take all the possible configuration. Okay, complete active space SCF. Now this is the so-called CAS SCF method, which is, I think the state of the art when you have to describe a, a strong correlation in molecular systems. So Lucas, did I answer your, your question? Okay. Um, I'd like to make two, uh, like one comment um, about this CAS thing. So, uh, because I said that you are somehow, uh, so you have to rotate the orbitals, but at the same time, you have to diagonalize the Hamiltonian matrix inside the active space, okay? When you do that, actually, uh, of course, if you're only interested in the ground state, uh, you will just pick up the ground state. But uh, in fact, uh, you could actually be interested also in the excited states that are generated inside your active space, okay? If they are available, why, why you would not consider them? So you can, in this method, calculate simultaneously both ground and excited states. And this is usually what people do in practice, okay? So, uh, so there is a simultaneous calculation, evaluation of, uh, of ground and excited states. So how, how does it work? So it's obvious if you do a CI calculation, you can pick up several states, okay? The only question is like, what, what are you doing with the orbitals? So, so this calculation can be done simultaneously. What I mean by that is you are using a single set of molecular orbitals to describe both ground and excited states, okay? And the, the obvious question is, okay, but how do you precede them? Because if it's simultaneous, it means that there must be a kind of democratic way of doing that. Uh, and, and, and actually, yeah, this is what's happening. So usually what you do is you consider a state average energy. So what I'm showing here is, uh, so this would be the individual energy of some state I, okay, which can be either ground or excited. So you have to do this orbital rotation process I talked about, but it's the same operator that rotates the orbitals in both ground and excited states. So of course, if you want to optimize the orbitals for everybody, the most democratic way of doing things is just to sum up all these energies, okay? You sum up them and you try to minimize this and you get what we call the state average uh, CAS-CF method, which is usually what uh, you can find in the, in the, in the literature, okay? Okay, um, and now, now finally uh, I'm reaching the, the, the end. So I will say a few words about the uh, perturbation theory. This is how I can make the connection with what Vincent has been telling you about, and, and then I will, will be done. So what is it on, in gray here on this slide is everything related to the CASSF, okay? And uh, well, these are the virtual orbitals. And I, I remind you, I said, when you do a CASSF calculation, these orbitals are never occupied, okay? So you don't really care about them. So in fact, this is a perfect playground for uh, describing actually the correlation that is missing. So now that you have done the CASSF, you have a better description of a, an, an approximate, but a better description of the system, better than Hartree-Fock, okay? Now what is missing are the fluctuations that Vincent was talking about, okay? And, and then, so what is missing, the correlation that is missing really now is can be understood as a fluctuation. So, which means that it might be possible to describe it, for example, with perturbation theory. So this uh, missing part of the correlation is referred to as dynamical correlation in the, in the, in the quantum chemistry uh, language. And the whole question is, okay, how should we proceed to do that? Okay, so I will finish with that. So, um, so how, how does it work in this context? What, what can we do? Okay, so I wrote here on the slide, uh, 
the, the, the formula that Vincent was showing, so Vincent has been showing the quantum uh, like perturbation theory in a very general way. And uh, so this is really the textbook formula that I wrote, and that's the expansion to second order. So when I write that, uh, I basically use the textbook formula, nothing else. Okay, so, uh, and you recognize in this formula, so the MCSCF is, uh, is now considered as my, my initial, uh, let's say energy um, in my Taylor expansion. So this would be my, in the language of perturbation theory, this would be my unperturbed uh, wave function. So I start from the MCSF and, and then I need to perturb it to recover the missing dynamical correlation. So these fluctuations that Vincent was talking about. So what has changed here is just that rather than starting from uh, the hot wave fog wave function, now I start from an MCSF, which is something smarter to do because it's a much better starting point. Okay. Okay, so the, the beta state, so, so the Psi MCSF is the analog of the alpha state that Vincent was talking about. And now there is a summation over all these so-called perturbers. Uh, this, was, this language was used also in Vincent's presentation. And these perturbers, uh, which I denote here a Psi I tilde, so I is an index, okay? So these are like the beta states in Vincent's talk. Uh, so they have some energy uh, that I just denote now, now e, e, I, tilde. Okay. All right. So when, uh, when you, you do MP2, so you start from the, your reference is, uh, is the hunter fog determinant. And uh, well, these perturbers are clearly identified. Uh, you know exactly what they are. And there are double excitations. So the singles do not contribute because of the Brillouin theorem. And, and the doubles come naturally out of the box, as Marcel was talking about, okay? But this is what's happening in MP2. Unfortunately, uh, it's a bit messy in all case, because when you have a multi-reference wave function, so you don't rely exclusively on a single Slater determinant, well, then all this beauty, formal beauty, uh, that usually describe with diagrammatic expansions and so on, somehow disappears, okay? So things are much more complicated and technical than they are in, in the MP2. So if you ask me, what should I do? Well, I'm gonna tell you, well, if you look at the literature, well, uh, you can do several things. So, so uh, there are actually various approaches. The reason why there are various approaches is because there's no unique way and, and, and clear way of how to construct the perturbation theory. And in particular, the question is, what are the perturbers? So this is an open question. There's no definitive answer to that. So in the literature, I just mentioned um, different methods. So like CASPT2, which is probably the most famous, and NEFPT2 also, or like the generalized uh, FANFLEC PT2. So what's common with these methods is that they all, uh, their, their name end, ends up with PT2, okay? But uh, of course they use different ingredients and so on. And I repeat, the reason is that there is no clear way of uh, actually um, constructing these, uh, these perturbers, okay? So, uh, and that's why there's no, I mean, some of these methods have advantages and so on, but uh, there's no clear way. It's not as elegant and fluid, I would say, as clear as uh, what you have in MP2. Okay, but uh, so nevertheless, uh, I wanted, and I will finish with that, just to give you an idea about uh, how you can find these perturbers and set up a, a perturbation theory, okay? And I will finish with that. Okay, so if we have a look at the, the textbook formula, uh, you realize that if you want to get non-zero contributions through, through second order in the, in the energy, uh, well, basically uh, finding the perturbers means finding all these wave functions that actually have an overlap with the Hamiltonian applied to the MCCF wave function, okay? This term should be non-zero. Uh, this is what matters, okay? This, will, this is what will contribute to the energy. So if you consider that as a block, so there is this wave function like Hamiltonian applied to the MCCF wave function and then overlap with this, well, that's a way to define the perturber. Okay, so, well then you say, okay, very good. I'm gonna start from my MCCF wave function, apply the Hamiltonian, and then I'm gonna see what happens, what, what happens. So, and this is where the second quantization formalism is quite convenient. So I rewrote here what we have seen uh, last week. I remind you in the Hamiltonian, the only thing you have are like single excitations that can be generated either from the one electron Hamiltonian or from the two electron operator. And you will also have double excitations, okay? 
So the Hamiltonian applied to your MCCF wave function will produce excitation. And this is how you're gonna be able to find what the perturbers are actually, okay. All right, so I can illustrate that, uh, for example, uh, with this uh, scenario. So let's say you focus on excitations that would make a hole in your inactive orbital space and put electrons, so one or two, depends if it's a single or, or double, into the virtual orbital space, okay? So, uh, so if you look at that from the point of view of all the electrons that are in the valence, okay? So, so the active orbital space, you can call this a valence space if you want. Well, in this process, you see the number of electrons will not change. So, and if I call it uh, N here, okay? So in what, in the uh, excitation that I'm describing here, this number of electrons will be fixed. So you have an N electron valence state and you do a perturbation theory on that basis. This is essentially the idea of this so-called N electron valence state perturbation theory, NFPT2, okay? So that's one possible way of tackling things. So if you do that, you identify, uh, let's say first class of perturbers. And you can also consider different excitations. So for example, you could make actually holes uh, in the active space, and then you can get n minus one if you do a single excitation, or n minus two if you have a double excitation. And by doing that, you generate again another class uh, of, of, of perturbers. That's essentially the idea. So when you uh, identify all the possible excitations, well, then you, you can construct your perturbation theory. So if I had to summarize the difference between FPT2 and MP2, I mean, in, in, uh, in, uh, in, in MP2, this uh, valence orbital, so this active orbital space does not exist. So things are much, much simpler, okay? Now you need to compose with that. You, there's no way you can do it otherwise because your problem is strongly uh, multi-configuration. Okay, so this is my last slide. I just wanted to show you what happens uh, with this NFPT2. So when you are uh, close to equilibrium, your, your H2 molecule is weakly correlated and you see there's no much difference between MP2 and NFPT2. So there's not much need to, to use a multi-configurational wave function there. But of course, when you start stretching the bond, uh, as you know, I mean, hartree fock breaks down, so MP2 is crap and then it's, be it's, it's becoming worse and worse. But now that you are using MCSF as a good starting point, of course, you dissociate into two neutral hydrogen atoms and FPT2 has nothing to do because there's no more electron repulsion, okay? So uh, that's why at the end you see NFPT2 gives you exactly the same result as MCSF. So in that case, NFPT2 is not very useful, of course, but, uh, but in a more general problem, uh, obviously it's gonna be super important. And in particular, when you have excited states, the dynamical correlation may uh, change completely the order of the excited states. So this dynamical correlation is not really a little uh, detail. Okay, so I'm gonna stop there. I think I'm done. So uh, I don't know if there are uh, more questions or... Oh, there is one question. After the rotations, does the new MCCF orbitals have the same property as hartree fock like symmetry orbital energy? Okay. So the symmetry, yes, because you, you, you still, yes, the symmetry, that's true. So for example, uh, at the end, you will still construct bonding and anti-bonding orbitals, okay? Uh, however, when you talk about energy, I'm afraid in this context, the concept of orbital energy is much more, is not well-defined. So uh, in a hot fog, you know, you have a single configuration, you have a fog operator, you diagonalize it, and, and the orbital energies are well-defined. In this context, it's complicated because it's multi-configurational. So you don't have this very nice uh, uh, property that you have either in DFD or 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 um, or uh, or uh, in hartree fock that orbital energies are actually uh, naturally uh, defined. The only way you can do it is through Koopman's kind of theorem. So if you if you rely on that, you can define a kind of multi-configurational orbital energy. Okay. But it's kind of a, it's more a subtle. So you lose many nice features, formal features of a, of a single reference method. So, okay, another question. I'm not sure I understood the why 
we do a state average for ah, for classes here. Okay. Uh, is it possible to rotate the orbital to optimize only one? Of, yeah, okay. So you could do that. Uh, so Galliana, that's correct. Uh, you could actually, sorry, you could do that. So the only problem that happens is that uh, if you optimize your orbitals specifically for states, it means that your states will not be orthogonal anymore. So, um, so and then this question is, how do you understand the, the excitation energy? So, I mean, you have like orbitals specifically for a specific excited state, and then you start to compute energy differences. You know from the exact theory that your state should be orthogonal, okay? If you had the exact solutions to the Schengen equation. So uh, the advantage of using the same set of orbitals for all the states around the excited is that they will by construction be orthogonal. I guess that's the reason why usually people do that. But then you can modulate. So here, uh, this is a completely, uh, sorry, this is a completely democratic way, but uh, sometimes people put some weights. So if they want to give more importance to one excited state than the other, okay? So this is the equal weight version, which is uh, I think the most common one. Uh, okay, there's another question. When does the state average approximation become dangerous to use? For example, introduce unwanted error if you are interested in a particular state or difference. Yeah, I think maybe Vincent, you should answer that because you've been working on this that you want sometimes to study a specific excited state. So uh, there is a question about uh, the problem of do doing a state averaging if you're interested in a specific state. So uh, maybe you can, uh, you can uh, say something about this. Yes, that that would be dangerous for uh, well, different well different reason. Well, probably there there, there are other other ways to treat the problem. In particular, if, you, if you're interested in uh, uh, spin state uh, energy differences, uh, well, let me start with something. Well, well, if if you're particularly interested in that, well, the, well, what you may observe is that the the orbitals of both states are not so different. So it's not that of a problem to use one set or the other. So I would say that as a, as a general answer, you can use, let's say, let's say if you have a singlet triplet energy difference to evaluate, you can maybe, well, either use the, the orbitals of the singlet or the orbitals of the triplet. I'm not saying that the, that you would get exactly the same answer, but it's not, it's not that a severe problem in terms of then after using a common set of orbitals to evaluate the energy difference at a higher level of calculation, let's say using a perturbation theory treatment like CASPT2, for instance. This is something that can be done. Well, evidently, if you use, let's say, the, the orbitals of the singlet in order to evaluate the, the triplet energy, then you're no longer in the context of Brillouin theorem for the triplet and you know all these things. And what you may expect is that, well, the PT2 treatment will cure that. And that's what has been observed. And if you want to evaluate such energy differences, you may go for other techniques and that we can, we can discuss, uh, well, later on if you'd like because there has been some specific method that have been devoted to spin state energy differences so so-called dedicated difference uh, ci calculation so-called ddci and that's something that has been uh, that has been very much used in the context of spin state energy differences calculations so my answer would be it's not that of a problem because, well, you may understand that, well, spin states differ mostly by the spin organization, you know, let's say in a classical view and not, but well, uh, so it's, it's, it's you, you can, you can safely work with, uh, with one set or the other or, well, different, that's a, that's a long story. I'm, I'm sorry. I mean, there are different, different strategy, different ways, but it's, it's fine. Yeah. So, okay, so Leo is satisfied. Thank you. Thank you. Also. Okay, maybe I answer the last question of, uh, of Lucas. Uh, so, 
Yeah, you're right. And FPT2 is a post cancer self treatment. So you have to, like, like MP2, you start with heart rate and then you do MP2 on top of it. And FPT2 or CASPT2 is the same. You start with your cancer self, you have to get your cancer self converged, okay, which is the demanding part of it, of the calculation. Once it's done, then you can apply perturbation theory. So you say, if we want to study excited state, the big molecule like porphyrin, should we always calculate the correction? Yes, because I mean, th that's also a serious issue with the excited state is that I heard that story many times and uh, Vincent, I guess I've seen that often also that you, the order, the ordering of your states, like you may get some ordering at the CASSF level and then it can be reversed or completely different when you introduce dynamical correlation. So it's not a little detail at all, actually, when you calculate excited state. Okay, so you're right in terms of computational cost. I mean, now what we're describing is like how you should do things if you're trying to design a many body wave function. But unfortunately, I mean, all these problems now, if you're trying to get to cheaper methods like DFT, uh, strong correlation, state averaging and so on, this is still a real challenge also for the DFT community. So uh, yeah, I don't think I can say more about that. But, uh, Okay, so I, I guess we should stop there. So thank you very much for your, uh, for your questions and uh, thank you very much, Vincent. I think it, it went well. <laughs> so, uh, thank okay, you good. very much. Okay. Thank you everyone. And uh, well, then, so next week, so Julien will give his lecture on density functional theory. So, uh, so uh, see you next week. Bye. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Thank you very much, Julien.